This is one of those images that I think we could very easily overlook. We was talking about this with the very first video in this set. If we was viewing this particular thumbnail, much smaller perhaps, in a sea of other thumbnails in Adobe Bridge, I think it would be very easy to go past this image and not give it a second glance. Well, sometimes, as I've suggested, that can be a bit of a mistake because I think everything we need in this image is there. So I think all of the qualities and the ingredients we need to make this a good shot are all there. We just need to do a little work to bring them out. But will that be in color or monochrome? Well, in our case, we're going to choose monochrome. But perhaps it's a bit more of a personal choice in this case. But there isn't a great deal of colour there. Now, I think we have good composition here. We have an interesting sky, but probably slightly less than perfect lighting conditions. But then this is not an untypical shot of the type we will all shoot in these types of conditions. So we have a landscape where we have no water to reflect light and add interest into the foreground. So let's take a look at taking this image towards the sparkling monochrome end result. And of course, the typical first stage, even though we're creating a monochrome, is to go to the options to change the lens corrections to remove chromatic aberration. Just in case I ever come back to this in the future, and if it's still there as a smart object, and I decide to reinstate the colour, I don't forget, and then introduce that horrible chromatic aberration around the dark areas against the light sky, because there's almost certain to be some here. Now the two little dots you can see in the sky in the centre there, they are in fact a couple of birds in flight, and if I zoom in you can see that, but they're not adding anything to our image. So, so we're not distracted with those, I think I'll deal with these and I'll also deal with any dust spots in the sky. But in actual fact, I doubt there's going to be many dust spots, but we'll talk about the reason in a moment or two. I'm going to double click the zoom to set the image at 100%, pick up my healing brush just drop the brush size down, give a little click and it should fix this pretty easily. And we know that if we're going to look, now look at that, I haven't quite got that, the brush isn't big enough, so I'm just going to drag the brush out a little bit to make sure it covers all of the bird. And I'll just move that ring, so one of those rare times when Photoshop let us down, it seems to have done the same thing here. So I'm going to click that and make that a little bit bigger too. There it is, disappeared. Let's make sure we've got that one done by making that a bit bigger. I think my feather command is a little bit too high here. I can drop it back. What I was about to say was, with the image at 100%, we can go to the top left, maybe, and go down and tick the box to visualize spots and start to move our way across the page. Now, there doesn't seem to be very much there. I'm not seeing the familiar little donuts here, but I'm sure there must be one or two. But of course, what we've got to remember, I don't think these are dust spots. We'll have a look a little later. But the thing we've got to remember with dust spots is the fact that we have a filter that sits over the top of the sensor in our camera. So any dust that falls onto the sensor, although we say it falls on the sensor, it actually doesn't. It falls onto the filter in front of the sensor. Now when we're using small apertures, that dust is focused more tightly and then we see it more. But here you can see I was using my lens probably wide open here at f5.6 and that's why we're not seeing very many dust spots. I think I'll call this to a halt. I'll untick that, hit Control zero and fit the image back on screen. Hit H to go back to my hand tool, which brings my other tabs into play. And I'll drop the saturation down to make a start. Looking up at the histogram, you can see we've got two peaks here because we've got 
a dark area in the foreground and the sky of course let's take a look at the foreground first the foreground does need a little more exposure I'm going to push up the clarity it almost certainly will brighten up the foreground let's see if I'm right there it just makes that foreground sparkle a little bit we've got a fairly light sky so I'm not too concerned about the trees going into silhouette I think they may actually help the picture and we've got some atmosphere behind them but I think we need more light there but how to achieve that well let's have a look at maybe raising the shadows a little bit that helps maybe we can bring the whites up and I'm not worrying too much about the sky at the moment and that helps a little too so I think the foreground there looks quite nice but I'd like a little bit more contrast supposing I took the blacks down a little bit then raise the whoops raise the exposure and that's added a little more sparkle I'm going to live with that for a moment but now I'm going to see if I can do something with the sky using a graduated filter so if I select the graduated filter I'm going to want a lot of density at the top so I can start my graduation or graduated line a little bit further down the screen click and drag of course we can always move it that doesn't look too bad I'm going to hide it just for a moment touch the V key and I can drop the exposure down quite a lot of impact coming in there I can perhaps even boost the clarity a little bit in the sky maybe even a little dehaze that sometimes helps look at that that puts a lot of power in the top perhaps the gradient is now looking just a little bit tight between the sky and the foreground so we can always bring that selection back with another touch of the V key so if I wanted to stretch this a little bit to make the graduated filter a little more graduated then I can do that and I think that's looking a lot better just for a moment I'll just touch the hand control you can see you can either touch the hand control here or just touch the H key I quite like the H key because it's convenient I'd like to bring a little more contrast through from the foreground so I'm going to make an attempt to just raise the tones a little bit in the grasses and this middle distance for that I think I'll turn to my adjustment brush you can see the exposure here is well down the clarity is up I'm just going to quickly reset these before I start if we set everything back to zero when I click into the picture we often get this little panel appear don't worry too much about it all it's saying to us is look I can't do anything with all of the sliders set to zero so in setting all the sliders back to zero when I click that's what causes the problem so all I need is just a little bit of a setting here in our case we want to lift the tones maybe they're more or less mid-tones so I won't change the highlights I'll just change the exposure a little bit and then when I start to brush onto the picture you can see the brush works perfectly but it did seem to be working rather fast so here I'm just going to scroll down and I'm going to make sure my flow rate is very low I've explained the reason for having the flow rate quite low on these brushes it means and in this case I could possibly take down the density a little bit but I'll take it down even more in this case what it allows me to do is to move over the area over and over again to build up the tone and that's a good thing but it, because it stops the brush from running away with us you can just see I can just sweep over those areas look at what I've done and decide whether I've done enough whether I need to change the brush and do something in a more local area or going to choose something slightly different but you can see I'm just trying to raise that tone there not too much but to give us a bit of contrast and I think I've got just about the maximum from there probably we could squeeze a little bit more from the middle distance but that's really all I wanted to do of course sometimes when we set the exposure 
we've got our exposure set to 1.2 but we can sometimes get it wrong and of course we may need to come in and adjust it but the good thing about these you can over type them sometimes so if you just make a mental note of what the previous setting was you can have a play around to see if you can get a better result but if you can't then there's an easy route back to what you had a few moments ago I'm going to double click the zoom tool I'm just going to take a look into the sky and there is another bird there so I'll get rid of that while I see it took the repair from quite a long way away but it's done the job I just want to look into the darker tones here just looking at the noise in the sky and it doesn't look too bad which means the exposure in the sky was just about right I think but what I may do is go back to my basic tab and then on to my detail tab just to add that little bit of luminance that I often do just a touch not much I mean you can go way too far with this and once it does the job it smooths out the tones so much they just look unnatural so I rarely go above about 20 and sometimes a bit less than that and that looks quite nice control zero will once again fit the image on screen now looking around the screen for any areas I need to do any work on I notice that there are still a couple of birds that I missed I didn't even spot them in the sky when I shot the picture so let me just pick up my brush and deal with these two and a small one there brush is a little bit big here but as I've said before I've got so much confidence in Photoshop that I don't worry too much have I got a little bit too much light coming in behind the trees I don't know I think it attracts us into the picture nicely seeing as we have an absence of something really in the foreground to give us depth we've got a bit but I think I'll leave those light tones because I think they'll draw us in I was looking at these mainly but I think there's lots of atmosphere in that valley and I think they look natural and acceptable I think what I'll do next though is to apply our radial filter I'm going to click and drag right click inside and reset the corrections for a moment you can take this off the screen don't worry if you need to do that cause sometimes we do I'm going to hit the V key as usual I usually have the feather here set fairly high and what I want to do same as always darken down the outer edge so we push the attention into the picture more and if you need to go bigger with your radial filter touch the V key and go down with your zoom tool I'm going to use control and shift spacebar click once so you can see I could always just pull these out a little bit if it was necessary to do so and the picture is now beginning to pick up quite a bit of sparkle now one of the questions I've just asked myself have I allowed that middle distance to go a little bit too dark I'm not sure to be honest I'm going to zoom in a little bit just take a look and maybe if I pick up my adjustment brush raise the exposure a bit maybe raise the shadow detail a little bit let's have a look at the flow rate because the flow rate is still set nice and small I'm going to make my brush bigger just move over this area you can see I'm working pretty delicately here so I'm just going to wipe my brush over the area then sort of move it out the way so I can see that looks rather dense there so I'll lift the tones there a little bit don't want to go too close to the edge if I there's a tip which sometimes I find difficult to explain but maybe I can demonstrate here let's hope this works okay when we're trying to darken a sky around trees or hills sometimes there's a tendency I think to go for a small brush and go really tight into the hills and what we often see as a result of that is a halo we actually make matters worse 
What I have tended to do for quite some time now is to take the flow rate down even lower. In this case I'll go down to 2. And as you can see I make my brush a lot bigger. So instead of trying to do little tiny clumps within this tree here, I do a much larger area. Now it has the same effect. Yes, it's going to lighten the sky a little bit around the tree, but sometimes it actually works far, far better than trying to go tight around the edge of something. And this one is another one in question. You can see it's just having an effect on the background as well, but it's not too much. And I'm using an enormous brush. Now you would expect me to make a small brush perhaps. A little bit of uh, density down here I can lift, but then I think I'm close now to opening the image up into Photoshop as a smart object as usual. Now I'm reasonably happy with the image, but I still want to try to get a little bit more impact and sparkle from it. And I'm going to turn my attention back to Google Nick filters. But what we're going to do here, we're going to work with a smart object. I think when we looked at the Google Nick filters before, we had our image flattened into a normal Photoshop or JPEG layer. Here, we've opened up our image from Camera Raw, and it's a smart object. So let's take a look at what happens when we apply the filter. I'm going to go to the filters, and down to Nick, and to the Silver Effects Pro 2. As soon as it reads the image, it should throw up a panel which says that Silver Effects Pro 2 has identified that the active layer is a smart object and it will now operate as a smart filter. The brush button will be deactivated and the effect will be applied to the current layer. I'm happy to tick the box to say don't show me that again. What it means is the local adjustments we can make here over on the right hand side has been deactivated because it's a smart object. I'm going to go to the left, we've got all of our results showing. So there's the top standard neutral image we've just created. So let me page down. The sky looks great there, doesn't it? But the foreground's not so good. That's no good. That's a bit too dark. Not too keen on that. We're down to our high structure harsh that we used before and Look, it actually does make a lot of difference to this image, doesn't it? It actually adds to the impact, and you can't ask anything more from a filter system that if you can take it nine-tenths of the way, and then the filter takes it that last tenth and does a slightly better job than perhaps you could do, and certainly quicker, then I'm all for that. Now, there's lots more as I've... I've said we can keep going down these and looking at all sorts of effects and sometimes we almost have too much choice. I was looking at this one and I said the sky was great, but don't forget we can change things. So what we could do here, if we wanted to use this option, we could decide to brighten this a little bit. So we've still got the good sky, but perhaps not quite so dark for the moment. Let me click OK to open this up back into Photoshop. Now the reason I wanted to pick that filter was to show you the smart object and the option we now have to temper the filter we've just applied. As you know, because we've just applied a filter to a smart object, we can go back into Silver Effects Pro by double clicking here and make changes at any time we like and we've got a mask here. So if I select the mask, for example, and I pick up black and our gradient tool with the linear option foreground to transparent, I could say, well, show me the sky that I got from the filter, but by putting a mask on there, I can have a slightly lighter foreground. So without too much effort, we've got a significant change already to our image and I think I've got near enough all of the pluses that I want with none of the negatives.
Now that's looking pretty good to me, but I'm just wondering whether we ought to just take a look back at that other filter which I looked at. So if I go back into my layers, I can go to the right of my smart object here, right click and choose to get a new smart object via a copy. I think I'll turn this bottom layer off just for a moment and I'm going to select my mask and reset that back to white. White is my background color at the bottom of the toolbox on the left so control backspace will do that because now I can double click the Silver Effects Pro and we'll go straight back in and we can take a look at those other two settings. We shouldn't get the warning panel appear now because I ticked the box not to show it. So the two options I was looking at earlier on was number five high structure harsh and number six high structure smooth. Out of the two I think marginally I like this one but I probably there's not a great deal in it. Let me click OK and you'll see just how long it takes to apply that to a 20 megapixel image doesn't take too long a nice set of filters and there you can see the difference so now we've got the opportunity to at least compare our two different choices now if you're not the impatient kind and you can save this as a Photoshop file and come back tomorrow that's a good way to work but here we haven't got that time so I'm gonna go back in here I'm gonna turn the bottom one on so I can turn the top one off and look at the bottom one, turn the top one on and decide which one of those two that I'd like to stay with. And I think now I'm looking at them, I think it's the, the top one. But of course I would save this as a Photoshop file and I could come back and look at these again tomorrow. Now I've got the image saved so I'm going to go to my layers because the one I'm going to discard is sitting at the bottom here. I can just flatten to finish but there's just one or two little things I'd like to do. There's a light spot in the sky up there. I'm going to pick up my lasso tool, make a quick lasso shape, hit the delete key and the enter key for content aware and that's done a pretty good job there. I've got a light area right on the edge there. I think I may see if I can do the same there, see if it will replace that with a darker tone. A little bit better but not quite perfect so let me pick up my spot healing brush and just give that a little touch to see if we can get rid of that. That looks alright. Another little one there, I'll use the brush as soon as I've got it in my hand so to speak. And a little bit light on that corner there. I won't try cloning out right on that edge. I think what I'll do is I'll pick up my burn tool I'll select highlights, I've got an exposure of 6%. Let me just zoom in a little bit so we've got a bit of space to work. Just a little bit of darkening down, not much, but just a touch. And looking around for any little distractions that I want to touch, maybe that one there. I'm just going to give this image as well a little bit more width. I'm going to go to my image menu, image size, I'm unclicking the width and height or unlinking the width and height by making sure they're not joined. What we got there, almost 19 inches, 20, I'm going to make the width 21 but leave the height as it is so I get that nice little bit of elongation that makes it look much more panoramic, I quite like that. Looking around the image now with a very critical eye, I think I may just try to tone down one or two of the light tones. Burn tool once again, highlights. Keep the exposure pretty low. I may go down even lower than that. And I may just move across this area just a touch. Not much, I don't want to spoil the gradation in the background and maybe just a little bit on that big cloud there but other than that I'm going to call it a finished piece of work. So here we are again with a very unfair 
comparison between the image we started with and the one we've completed. This one, now we've got our eyes used to the sparkle of that black and white, looks even more dull than when we first opened it up. So there's the starting image and there's the image we've created. And there's a significant difference, as is obvious. But I do believe that thumbnail was easy to just walk past and ignore.